Hi guys, Sonova here with another week worth of true crime discussions. Um, this week I am talking about the scam and murder that actually revealed the Dixie Mafia to the mainstream public. Up until this happened, very few people had even heard of the Dixie Mafia. Um, and they, uh, the corruption was just kind of an undertow that everyone knew about, but the term hadn't really been heard. So this week, that's what we're going to be talking about. It's the murders of Judge Sherry and his wife, Margaret. Um, before I get into that, if you don't know who I am, my name is Sonova Cantrell. I am Southwest Missouri's number one true crime writer and blogger. Um, I write obscure cold cases about missing persons and, and cold cases and all different sorts of things um, as a victim's advocate for Missouri Missing Organization. I also uh, run the Murder to Mississippi website where I try to bring publicity to old Dixie Mafia cold cases and such. So uh, if you like that sort of content, jump on over to sonovainc.com. Sign up for my weekly true crime newsletter where you get all sorts of information and content free just for you. Um, my website, S-W-S-Y-N-O-V-I-A-I-N-K.com. So uh, jump over there, get your free ebook for signing up, and then come back here and subscribe to this channel if you like this type of content. So let's jump right in. For those of you that don't know, I have an entire series on the Dixie Mafia. It started out being known as the State Line Mob, and then... Um, some of the scragglers that were left over from the state line mob after they were sort of wiped out um, created what was known as the Dixie Mafia in the 80s. So here are a picture. Here is a picture of our two murder victims. Can you see that? You've got Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife, Margaret. Now, Vincent Sherry was a judge, um, but his wife was also a former councilwoman and was going to be running for mayor. She was very vocal against corruption. She was very vocal against um, gambling and all sorts of vice that had kind of taken over Biloxi, Mississippi and the, that area. And so uh, when they were murdered, um, the law enforcement had a hard time trying to, to figure out who would have done this because obviously the judge would have had enemies with his work and then Margaret would have had enemies with her work. So uh, we're going to jump in. I'm going to tell you um, the story as I have researched it and found it, but I also have a little bit of inside knowledge. Um, you can check out my blog posts that have this type of, can you see it? This is a logo for the Anderson files a series of blog posts um, that kind of link into this. Um, there's a little bit of inside information that people aren't aware of that hasn't been publicly uh, put out there too awful much. Um, well, it has. It's just been recent. So, okay. So I titled this, The Lonely Heart Scam Leads to the Murder of a Judge and Wife. Well, um, on September 14th, 1987, Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife, Margaret, were found murdered in their home. They were, the official story says they were discovered by uh, the judge's former law partner, Pete Halat, and a junior law uh, associate in that office. Um, I contend that there was someone else in that house before then, and by the end of the series, you will figure out who it is. So, um it would take 10 years to solve this case. Now, the in law enforcement had an idea that they had from pretty close to the beginning, but they couldn't find the evidence to tie it together. And it would take 10 years of, of, of legal wrangling and investigation on the part of FBI agent uh, Keith Bell and the, uh, the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Spacito, um, to get justice in this case. So um, here we go. Um, on September 16th, two days after they were killed, Pete Halat and a junior partner finds the body of the Sherry's. Now, the way it worked, the story goes is the judge didn't show up for, for um, he didn't show up for court. And someone called Pete Halat and said, hey, is he there? Um, we have court and he's not here. Pete says, I'll run over to the house and check on him since he wasn't answering the phone. Pete takes a junior partner from the office and they go over to Judge Sherry's house. Now, the deal is what people don't realize is um, 
or you might if you've studied the case. Pete Halat ran this law firm with Cherry. So the sign over the door was Sherry and Halat Law Firm. Well, when he became a judge, Judge Sherry left the law firm, but they were still somewhat partners while he was still, you know, being a judge. So uh, it was kind of, it was, you know, not uncommon for him to be there. So that was a, uh, you know, the first place they called to try to find him when he doesn't answer the phone. Okay, so supposedly the law partner and Pete, they get to the house um, and they find the door ajar and the, the partner hollers at Pete. Pete walks, just steps right into the house and right out and says, uh, the judge and his wife are dead. And uh, later on, that little saying would sound suspicious and find out why. But uh, uh, here's the deal. Um, there was actually someone else in that house before of this. The day before, the first day after they were dead, someone else came into that house with Pete Halat. Now, here's where we get into our theories and our, um, our, we have evidence, but it is official, it's not the official record. Um, there was a small time lieutenant named Anderson that actually found the bodies the day before. And for whatever reason, it was hushed up. Halat told him to go home. Um, he would take care of it. Well, it was officially discovered the next day. Why? I'm not sure, but we will get into more detail on that in the next video. This video, we are talking about the the case, the scam that, that um, actually caused all of this. It would take 10 years before investigators would figure out what happened in this case. Um, they investigated all, you know, all the um, all the people that the judge had been working with. Did he sentence someone to prison and they got mad? They got out and they wanted revenge. You know, um, like I said, Margaret was very vocal um, against corruption in a very extremely corrupt city. So, um you know, they both, you know, had reasons and people that may want to cause them harm. So um, this is the way it works. So they have a funeral a few days after the murder. They have a funeral at the Blessed Virgin Mary Cathedral on Howard Avenue in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, the newspaper reports that over 300 people would attend the service. So these are very prominent people. Um, and strangely, during the service, you have, um, you know, everyone there to pay their last respects. All the families there, they are just absolutely distraught. Their world is collapsing. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of this chaos, Pete Halat decides to stand up and, and do a eulogy. And he, he wasn't scheduled to speak, nothing. He just stands up there and takes the podium. And he instead of, you know, bemoaning the loss of his friends and, and what good people they were, he goes into an immediate, very long um, speech about how the corruption in the city needs to be taken care of, and he's going to run for mayor, and he's going to clean up the city, and, and he spends an enormous amount of time uh, on his political campaign, right? in the middle of the funeral. And if that wasn't uh, strange enough, and if that wasn't uh, just arrogant and inconsiderate enough, this man uh, makes copies of his speech and sends it out to the local media. So he decides to launch his political career for mayor um, in the middle of a funeral of his supposed good friend and business partner. So, um, that is that rubs everyone wrong immediately but you know uh they just you know just because someone is an arrogant jerk doesn't necessarily mean that they have anything to do with the murder so you know it's kind of brushed over now um when 
this caused a lot of panic in the public and the community. And so when the police went around to, you know, canvass the neighborhood, and I mean, this is a nice neighborhood. These, these weren't, um, you know, uh, broke people living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, these were aff affluent people and it was a nice neighborhood. This was not supposed to be where the crime happens. You know, everyone has that facade in their head that the crime happens elsewhere. But um, on that evening, it happened there. And um, but it it caused such fear, because if you're not safe in your own home, if you're not safe as a as a judge, you know, you you have power. You are a very powerful person legally as a judge. Um, how how can this how can you be safe? You know, that was kind of the mentality. Other political leaders in in the town. Um, we're getting death threats and things, um, you know, from copycat um, people. And, and, and so there was uh, law enforcement was actually, you know, watching different political leaders and keeping an eye on them and surveilling them uh, to make sure they were safe. I mean, this was a very chaotic time for more than just the family. And so none of the neighbors really wanted to talk to law enforcement. They were afraid to. They, they didn't want to be seen speaking to law enforcement about anything. But um, it's different when you're talking to the daughter that just lost her parents. And so Lynn Spacito, she comes down. She lives out of state. She comes down and she starts canvassing the neighborhood. And one neighbor talks to her and says, Look, there was this strange car in the in this neighborhood on the night your parents were killed. It was a yellow Ford Fairmont, um, and it it just wasn't the kind of car that was in that neighborhood. I mean, a uh, Ford Fairmont's just a, a cheap little car. Um, it's not a car that would normally be in this higher class neighborhood. And uh, just the way it was driving, it, it was suspicious to this neighbor. Well, um, she automatically, Lynn, automatically runs to uh, the law enforcement and tells them this. So uh, within this all happens within the first week or so of the killings. And uh, they find that Ford Fairmont relatively quickly. It was less than two miles away from the murder house. So they know um, that right there makes it, you know, um, obvious that it's it's most likely the getaway car. It matches the description. It is really close to the crime scene. Um, but then also there was other things about the car that made it unusual. Um, someone had taken and dismantled the dome light. They didn't smash it. They just took the cover off of it and removed the light bulb. So whoever was um, in that car didn't want to be seen. So that that right there was unusual to find an abandoned car with that all dismantled and laying there. Um, then the next thing that was unusual, the car had been stolen. Now here's where, um, let me find that book. For those of you that follow my notes, you know that I have I, I, I read a lot and I study a lot. Um, this is one of the books that I read while I was studying this case, Mississippi Mud. This is the older edition. I think it has a new cover on it. Um, if you go on Amazon, you can get one of these. I highly recommend it. It's a good book. But this is one of the things in there that there's some slight discrepancies in this book because this book was written as it was unfolding. So. Um, you'll find that 20 years later, it's easier to write a book about something because you have all the details. Well, this is one discrepancy. It's so minor. It's not really that important, but it is in there. Um, some reports say that the car was stolen the day before the murder. And the book says that the car was stolen that morning. I looked through all the documents I could find and I could not verify it. So it was stolen really close to the murder. That's that's the important thing. We know it was stolen just before the murder. Um, it was stolen off of a lot. So someone went to take it for a test drive, basically, and didn't take it back. Then um, not only was it stolen, but the tags on it were from another stolen car. Um, and that had been abandoned three years ago. It was a Firebird and it had been stolen and abandoned 
um, three years prior. So we know that this is obviously the getaway car. So they find it, they they impound it, they, you know, they do all their testing, whatever testing they had available in in 1987. But um, they don't find much with the specific car, you know, as in DNA, fingerprints, anything else. Later on down the line, you'll find out why um, one of the informants would tell law enforcement um, and a jury that they put super glue on their fingertips so they wouldn't leave um, they wouldn't leave fingerprints. Um, of course, nowadays we know that that wouldn't work because you leave trace DNA everywhere you go. You know, you leave skin cells, you leave hair, you leave, you know, you're going to leave a piece of yourself anyways. But at that time, fingerprinting was the big thing. And so they had that covered. So but anyways, um, what really um, got the ball rolling with this car was the fact that they those tags were stolen off of another abandoned car. Now, those tags were linked back to the Firebird that was abandoned in front of a um, an apartment complex nearby. And that apartment complex um, had called it in. And then they had called in a friend to strip the car for parts before it was towed away. Well, this friend that stripped the car for parts and obviously took the license plates was named Lenny Sweatman. Now, Lenny Sweatman... As soon as they heard the name, investigators knew that the Dixie Mafia was uh, was involved because he was a Dixie Mafia member and he had really close connections to Mike Gillich. Mike Gillich owned the Golden Nugget Light, uh, nightclub there in Biloxi, and he was a notorious Dixie Mafia rogue. And he actually had uh, was entangled into this investigation. Um the deal with this scam was the investigators, they knew about this Lonely Heart scam uh, with Mike Gillich and someone else. Um, and they also knew about the murder. Well, now they are very loosely connected through these license plates. But the problem being, um, that's not enough to say that this was the cause of the murder. We just know that the same group of criminals that are, uh, you know, doing everything under the sun, including murder, have something to do with this murder as well. So it wasn't enough to to really get a conviction, but it was enough to get started. And so um, Mike Gillich is working with a Kirk C. Nix. Um, if you guys have been watching all my videos, you will know that Kirk C. Nix Jr., um, goes all the way back to the state line mob gang and he was one of the suspects in the Buford Pusser ambush. Um, we're not sure that we can't prove it. He still denies it even though he's been in jail for decades. Um, um, so there's no proof of that, but that ties him back all the way to Buford Pusser. Okay. So Kirk C. Nix is in jail for life. He is in jail for um, killing a grocer, um, and, and on Easter morning. And so, but he knows he's in this very corrupt neighborhood that he might possibly be able to buy his way out of this life sentence. So he creates this gigantic scam, um, to rip off gay men, um, and con them into giving him money. And so he creates this whole scam from behind prison bars. Mike Gillich is one of his runners on the street. Um, and you'll find out there's several other people in this, um, in this scam. Well, in my next video, I'm going to go in depth into that scam. And I'm going to tell you how the law enforcement finally linked that scam to the Dixie Mafia and to the murders of Judge Sherry. Um, I am sorry this video is already 20 minutes long. Um, I try to keep them as short as I can. So I'm going to cut it off here. And I will make another video with uh, that will explain the scam and how uh, the Dixie Mafia is finally brought down uh, and the Judge Sherry murders are, are you know, receive some justice. So if you like this content, make sure and like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Jump over there to my website, sonovainc.com. Sign up for my newsletter. It's all free and you get a free ebook. And I will see you next time around. Bye-bye.